afternoon. Welcome to all of you who are joining us today for our April version of Third Thursdays. We're so glad that you could come. I'm Janine Bertie Johnson. I am alumni director at AMBS as well as director of campus ministries. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. If you have a technical concern at any time during the webinar, please send a chat to the AMBS webinar host. And if you have a comment or question for our speaker, we ask that you please use the Q&A function, which you can find by hovering over the bottom of your screen. I'll be watching for those questions and comments and, and I'll select the ones that I'll ask Alan. Please note that the webinar, including questions, is being recorded. Turning now to our conversation, Alan Rudy Froze is Associate Professor of Christian Proclamation at AMBS. He received his MDiv degree from AMBS in 1992 and also learned, earned a PhD from Emmanuel College at the Toronto School of Theology in 2012. He's been part of the AMBS faculty since 2011, and his research interests include preaching practice, methodology, and theology, the human voice and body, and storytelling. Alan will start by answering several questions I have for him, and after that, we'll have time for your questions and comments. So, Alan, thank you for being here today. What would you like to tell us about yourself as an introduction? Oh, yeah, that's good. Well, you did a fine introduction there of, of some of the important things in my life. For instance, the reality that I've been at AMBS now for 11 years, going on to the 12th. It's the longest time I've ever had a full-time like job that long. It's, it's great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I grew up in Canada and lived most of my life in Canada in different parts. Uh, uh, grew up in British Columbia and Saskatchewan, and then moved to Manitoba, and then lived in Ontario for many years, and um, was a pastor for many years before I uh, decided to do a PhD in homiletics and preaching. And um, yeah, something about myself that I that I find interesting is that I live in two places. Uh, our whole family was uh, in Goshen, Elkhart area. Uh, for the first six, seven years of, of uh, my time at AMBS. Um, uh, and then through various circumstances, um, Marilyn had to move back to Canada. And so um, I live in two places. I live in Elkhart and I also live in Kitchener, uh, Ontario, where my wife and our young adult children um, live. And so I travel back and forth um, in fall. I'm mostly um, at, a, at AMBS. And then travel here to Kitchener. I'm I'm speaking from Kitchener today, and then in winter I live mostly in Kitchener, but still drive back and forth a lot to um, to AMBS to my apartment there. So I live in these two places. They're about seven eight hours apart in the car. I love the drive actually. Um, it's kind of a liminal space. Um, who am I? I'm traveling from one place to the other. Um, and uh yeah i love to cook that's another thing i want to say um uh, i don't i mean hobbies yeah i have some hobbies i wish i had some more vigorously physical hobbies um but yeah i love to cook i love to cook for our family i even love to cook by myself in my place in elkhart and experiment with all kinds of things and um yeah that's all i'll say for now that's an introduction there you go thank you <clears throat> questions we've asked each person joining us is how have you experienced God in a powerful way? Do you have one or two stories that you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I, I think um, I had some of these questions before Janine uh, presents them here. So I've been thinking about this one for a while. And I think uh, what I want to say here is that I've experienced God in this rich thing that we call Christian community. I think uh, in high school and uh, my college years in Winnipeg um, and at AMBS uh, as a student and then as a faculty member, there's something beautiful about being in, in Christian community where we worship together, we work together, and um, uh, God is revealed in these places. I, I think the, the experience more recently of working on the Voices Together um, hymnal and, and worship resources collection. That was a, a mighty 
spiritual experience um, where, I mean, it wasn't just the sort of the central group that was meeting, but all these different consultants and all these many, many, many groups coming together from many quarters of the world and from North America, um, trying to figure out what how we worship and how we sing and how we speak and and how we approach God. This was very powerful um, spiritually for me. Yeah. We might have some more questions about that experience. Uh, Good, sure. On that yeah. later, but um, yeah. for now, I'm I'm curious. Um, what attracted you to be part of the Ambius community as hmm. a faculty member? you are one who came back. So. Yeah, you know, so when I was a little boy, I was six years old and we lived in British Columbia and we, my parents worked at a place called Camp Squia. And at Camp Squia in summers, uh, Clarence and Alice Bauman came to set up a hermitage, like a little cottage in the woods. Um, and I would go up to visit them and they were eccentric. I mean, not only just eccentric, they were, I mean, he was an academic, which, which totally blew me away. And I found that really interesting, but they were also very eccentric. I mean, um, like they named the bears and raccoons around the area and had conversations with them. And I mean, there's a kind of mystical thing going on there too, but um, no, I mean, I remember my dad once saying that he wanted to have Clarence, um, talk for 15 minutes at a fireside and Clarence said something like, yeah, I don't know what I do. I usually talk for three hours at a time. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, um, not that we do that at AMBS these days anymore, but I was like, wow, what is this? And, and Clarence, I saw Clarence studying for hours and hours and hours a day. And I was like, wow, what is that? So over the rest of my life, I mean, I always kind of followed what was going on at AMBS and uh, was listening keenly to people who were studying there. And um, yeah, and then uh, in my days of university at the University of Winnipeg, um, I remember um, a very particular incident where Martin E. Marty, a uh, Lutheran uh, historian, came to lecture at the University of Winnipeg. and. I was really struggling with what to do the next year after I graduated. And he said something like, if you're interested in sort of spreading your wings out, um, uh, I was interested at that time in comparative religion. Uh, he said, if you're interested in comparative religion and actually speaking with people of other faiths, you've got to dig down deep in your own tradition. And that was the night I applied to AMBS, right? I mean, I always knew it was there. And um, yeah, it was, it was uh, for me, it was a, a, a sort of a longing uh, to dig deeper into the Anabaptist Mennonite tradition. And then after you studied here, what made you want to come back to teach? Oh, well, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's one of the very few Mennonite <laughs> seminaries in North America and the world. So that helps. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love the community there. It's, uh, it's uh, I mean, the, the, the teaching faculty, staff, students, that was always a very positive experience for me. Um, I, uh, I love the way that academics are blended with a sort of a rigorous um, spiritual life. Um, I'm still always working at that. <laughs> but, um, and, and I like the I, especially now, I love the way that the teaching faculty and others work really well together. That's, that's a really, it's a real strong, strong thing for me. And, you know, when I attended AMBS 30 some years ago, yeah, it was a very international kind of place and it still is. I mean, it's gone through different kinds of iterations over the years and international means different things then than it does now. But um, I loved when I was a student there and now that I teach there, the interactions with, with Mennonites and, and people from Christian faiths all over the world. It's, it's a great place to be. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to um, describe the different courses you're teaching this yeah. year and a little bit about each of them. And then if there's some courses that you aren't, that aren't in your rotation this year, but you'd like to uh, tell about those as well, it would be great for people to hear 
the variety of things you're teaching. Sure. So, I mean, one of the main courses that I teach is preaching. And um, last year, I got to teach preaching three times. What a great year. I taught it in fall. I taught it in winter. And then I taught um, every other year. I teach it uh, at uh, Connor Grable University College here in, on in Ontario and in Waterloo. And uh, yeah, so I love teaching preaching. Um, I, uh, my, my, uh, one of the ways that I approach preaching is that it's a physical bodily experience and we're using our voices to communicate. So we actually do a lot of voice work in the preaching class. Um, I think voice is very connected also with our ideas. Sometimes I get this thing, well, aren't you working on content uh, as well? And it's like, well, of course I am. Um, but we're going to get to that also through through the voice. Uh, so um, and then I also teach a voice course specifically, and I'm looking forward to teaching that this fall. Uh, I teach LEAP these days, which is leadership, education, and Anabaptist perspective. <laughs> All these acronyms. Um, so the LEAP course is a is a uh, a course that's um, it's it's an orientation course for AMBS. So it's the first course that a lot of students take at AMBS. The students are online in early August, and we all come together uh, for this this crazy, intensive, beautiful week. Uh, in August, where um, I coordinate that, I do some teaching in that, and um, all the faculty at different teaching faculty and staff and teachers at AMBS all get together and we work with the new students and we try to um, help them um, get oriented to academic life and to AMBS life. Um, and it's it's a it's 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 like camp, you know. It's exhausting, and it's also beautiful. Uh, to have everybody together for that um, experience. I teach biblical storytelling and I will teach that in May. I'm looking forward to that. So an intensive course in May over two weeks. Um, yeah, biblical storytelling. So it's, it's. I mean, it can be an, a, a number of other things than this, but it's, it's memorizing biblical texts and telling them in a compelling way. And so I'm using a lot of my voice work with that as well. I also teach a course uh, called Performing the Faith. I'm not teaching that this year or next, but um, it's a it's performance theory. So um, uh, it looks sort of more broadly at how it is uh, that we performance theory is it, it mixes up anthropology and liturgy and um, ritual studies and all kinds of things and looks at how it is that we perform uh, in public. And so we do talk a lot about worship and we talk a lot about various kinds of performances in worship, but we also talk about other kinds of performances. I'm performing right now. Um, and so is Janine, even though she's sitting there just like that, um, uh, we're always performing in certain ways that um, uh, where we're um, sort of welcoming others in or not. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by this, by performance theory. It's, it's, a, it's a great great topic. And then I also teach a course every year called Ministry in Church and World. And uh, this is a course where in sort of the middle time, often the second year, but for some, uh, for other students, it's, it's the third or fourth year, when they are working in a, in a church setting or in a in an internship of some kind, it can be in a community center or a hospital. Um, there's been lots of different kinds of placements. And then I meet with the students on Wednesday afternoons and we have very organized ways of processing what it is that they're going through as interns and integrating all kinds of other things from other AMBS courses. It's a lot of fun. I think you also teach a course called Rest and Play. Oh, yes, that's got right. That one. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, Please. I'm teaching it right now. Yeah, Rest and Play. It's yeah. so much fun. And, you know, one of the things that I've loved about AMBS is they they let me invent courses. Like, <laughs> and I mean, not without some due thought and I don't get to do anything I want, but Rest and Play, right? So we have a lot, a lot of these one hour courses at AMBS on spiritual with the spirituality focus and um, rest and play. So I came up with this one. And I mean, one of the things that I, I mean, I love humor and um, and I love playing and 
Uh, I mean, we play instruments, we play all kinds of things, but adults kind of forget to play um, at a certain time. And um, so, yeah, we, we explore play and various aspects of play and we play. <laughs> Uh, and then um, rest as well. So we do get into kind of Sabbath rest, but we sort of uh, also talk about leisure. And we talk about how, um, um, how I mean, leisure is a, is, a, is, is a pretty recent kind of term and a phenomenon. It's very middle class. And um, we talk about how we spend our time. So rest and play, it's a lot of, yeah, again, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> And is that the only one hour spiritual practices course you teach? Yeah, um, I teach a voice class as well, voice and identity. So that, um, and, and, and just for this coming year, we're doing something that we've never done before at AMBS, as far as I know. So these one hour classes, I mean, they have different kinds of, uh, they're, they're taught in different ways. Um, uh, so what we're gonna do with this one is it runs Tuesday morning, all morning, so it's, you know, two and a half hours of being together, and that's it. There's no homework. Um, often we run these classes where it's a one hour class and there's one hour of actual teaching per week, and then students do homework for three hours, two hours, whatever. Um, this one is the reverse. So it's all happening in the classroom. We're gonna read in the classroom. We're gonna play games in the classroom. We're gonna work with our voices and talk about our voices and our identity. And um, uh, yeah, so that's an experiment. And um, if anybody wants to sign up for that, it's Tuesday mornings. This is an advertisement. There you go. Can uh, alumni audit that one? Yeah. Uh, no. Well, you no. can. Uh, you have to be on campus, though. You it's on only campus. it's okay. only on campus. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for describing all those courses. They sound awesome. Um, wondering about your current research interests. What are you working? Yeah in terms of uh, outside of the courses you teach? Yeah, I mean, one of the, um, well, there's kind of three things. One, one, I'm still working on this, uh, working on this voice certification so that I can be an official teacher of the Kristen Linkletter voice uh, and theory. And so that I'm, I'm spending time in Scotland this summer, uh, three weeks, and then three weeks next summer as well. And then I will be certified as a voice teacher, voice for actors and speakers and worship leaders and preachers and so on. Uh, it's not voice for singing, it's voice for speaking. Um, so that's a very exciting thing. And I, uh, and connected to that is a second thing. Um, one of the areas of research I'm into is stage fright for people who work in the church, especially for preachers and worship leaders and song leaders and so on. Um, over my time in the church, I, I keep hearing that, right? I keep, and, and I have a lot of stage fright myself, believe it or not. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of anxiety about standing in front of people. Uh, and this is, a, this is a, a, a significant thing. And one of the things that makes it a bit different in the church is that, you know, we have this, this thing that we're, we're kind of, we're not just in front of people, we're, we're serving God. And uh, you know the preacher or the or the worship leader or the reader of scripture is is speaking for God in a way. We talk about that sometimes, and so it it's. I mean, one of the things that got me onto this was people who teach regularly as school teachers or whatever they teach economics at the university or something, and they they have no tension when they're doing their particular lecture or teaching grade five or whatever but they don't speak in church they refuse to speak in church they will not preach they will not read scripture because it's too it's this holy space right and there's kind of too much at stake or something so that that is a fascinating thing and 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 the i mean one of the things connected to to voice and stage fright is that there's all kinds of fun things we can do uh to warm up uh our bodies before we preach or worship lead or so on. Um, and that's a lot of fun. The biggest project I'm working on is swearing, cursing. Um, I've been fascinated by swearing ever since I was a kid and uh, had experiences in high school uh, and, and other times. And I mean, I'm just noticing that Christians are swearing a lot more than we used to, even evangelical Christians. Um, that's anecdotal, all of that. but. Um, and a lot of people don't swear. I realize that, but 
uh, swearing is all around us, and uh, I'm fascinated by that. Um, uh, we swear primarily in three general areas. One is around the holy, and then we swear um, around sort of the body and sexuality, and then we swear around the other, right? We have all kinds of bad names for people we don't understand, um, uh, whether it's uh, racial comments or cultural comments or gender comments and so on. So those three areas are, um, they're, they're really intertwined too. So the work I'm doing is mostly on kind of those first two areas. And that is the, the, ways, the way we swear around our bodies and we use body parts and just sort of declare that a swear word and call somebody that. <laughs> And then the religious words, right? Um, we use a lot of religious words to uh, when we curse, when we swear. And what what is that? What's at the bottom of all of that? Um, so I'm wondering. I, I think the central kind of question is is what's behind all of this, right? What is behind uh, the language that we use generally, and and strong language, and and then specifically what could be behind each of these, some of these individual words. Now I have to find a Christian publisher. Now this is one of the issues, right? Um, what words can I use? What words can't I use? Um, these are huge issues. And I mean, just lately I did a, um, an interview on CBC radio in Canada here, and it, it was broadcast across Canada. Uh, in a particular show called Tapestry. And, and I mean, we talked, I talked to the interviewer for like 40 minutes. And one of the questions I had was, which words do I get to use? And they said, oh, well, we'll just have the interview. And then it goes upstairs, right? To the people at CBC and they decide. And interestingly enough, so they, they beeped out a lot of words. They beeped out some pretty mild swear words, I thought. And then they didn't beep out other ones that I thought were more severe. And they actually said, one of the producers actually said that they, because it's, it airs on Sunday afternoon, they beeped out more than they thought they would. Sunday afternoon, right? So again, it's this, and that's fascinating. It's this tension between the religious sort of piety and swear words. And yet we use a lot of these swear words uh, a lot of these religious words of swear words, right? Anyways, I'm fascinated by that whole thing. <clears throat> and you're and hoping those are the, the those book, are the right? Part. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm on sabbatical next winter, and I plan to um, write the book on it. There's lots of great books on swearing. There aren't a lot of good books that explore it kind of from a Christian point of view. And I'm not exploring it from a kind of morality point of view, shall we swear or not swear. Um, that's probably not very interesting for a lot of people. I'm more looking at what what's going on in us that um, that that produces these words that come to uh, that come out. Sometimes we're not even thinking about it, and there they are. Thanks. Um, wondering what dreams you have for AM. Mm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I love the uh, the directions that we're that um, I see happening from the administration these days, and this this was there uh, long before the kind of new administration. I, was, I know Sarah Wanger Shank was working on this, but these these connections we're making with Ethiopia and with Korea and and Mennonite World Conference, I think this is very exciting. I think we're um, I, I guess one of my dreams is that we become even more of an international community and that that has to start shaping us in some pretty radical ways, I think. Um, but I'm excited about that. And I think I think the the kind of rich diversity that we have on the campus um, tells us something about the kind of rich diversity we could we could also have kind of um, collaborating with lots of uh, Christians around the world. I find that really exciting. Just adding on to that, how how do you think that might affect your teaching roles? Like, oh, totally. How has your teaching <clears throat> pre 
teaching changed as you have worked with students from other than North American contexts? Oh, yeah, that's a great topic. And I, I've, I've really learned a lot. I mean, one of the things that, um, and this, this has to do with voice as well. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I've, that I've started in the last several years is that um, students don't have to preach in English in our class, right? The first sermon often is in English, but the second sermon, they generally preach two sermons in the preaching class. It can be in whatever language you feel most comfortable in or the language that you're going to be using when you go back home, wherever that is. Um, because then you see a very different body and you hear a different voice, right? I mean, uh, somebody who's more recently learning English or English as a second language that, yeah, the sermon comes off and there's some interesting content and I mean, it can be a great sermon, but the person is not always quite there. Right. But, and that'd be true for me too. I mean, if I was preaching in French or German, my goodness, it would, it would, I would be so worried and concerned about getting the words right that myself, my body, my voice don't come across. Um, so. When, for instance, an Ethiopian, one of our Ethiopian students preached in English, it was very different um, when he did his second sermon in Amharic. And then the whole body and voice were involved in different ways. So that's just one of the things that we're, uh, we're working on in preaching. I, I think that the, the, the next thing to work on is, I mean, in preaching class, we don't have time to hear long sermons. In fact, the sermons are even shorter than we often would preach in North America. So I'm asking students often to preach 10 minute sermons or even eight minute sermons, depending on how many students we have in the class. And we don't have time to hear those long sermons. But um, I'm very likely to, uh, teaching a preaching class in Ethiopia next year and there sermons tend to be 45 minutes to an hour long. So that is going to be a brand new kind of event for me. And most of the forms we have of preaching that come out of Europe and North America are really based on a sermon that is 25 to 30 minutes long at the very longest, right? So preaching for 45 minutes or an hour, this is something I'm really going to have to work at. And we have a number of Ethiopian students who've been helping me with this already, and I'm really thankful for that. <laughs> and one other question I have, and then uh, I, I encourage you to start putting your questions and comments into the Q&A. Um, but Alan, do you have any questions for the alumni who've joined us today? Yeah, you know, um, what I would be fascinated to hear from alumni is, what did you study at AMBS? Like, what was the program you were in? And what did you graduate with? Like, was it an MA in Peace Studies? That's the old degree they had. Uh, MA in Theology. Was it an MDiv with a concentration in whatever? And then what did you do with it, right? I mean, one of the things that we've been looking at at AMBS is, are the MDivs, for instance, that we have, are those true to what people actually do with them, right? So we have a kind of, uh, a kind of focus in the MDiv studies where you can take, you know, chaplaincy or pastoral ministry or concentrate in theology and peace studies. Uh, Christian formation is another one. And then what happens is, so there's certain courses in each of those. And then what happens is you, you do a thing in Christian formation and then you go work as somebody who's involved in an organization that works on peace issues, right? Or you get a peace degree here and then you become a pastor, right? So um, we're always trying to connect these things to actual experience. So I'd love to hear what you studied at AMBS and then what you're doing <laughs> with it. <laughs> Great. So that's the kind of thing, if you wanna put in chat uh, what, uh, your answer to Alan's question, what did you what did you focus on in your studies and what did you do with it? Um, we have one question that's come in already um, from Laura Funk, who's very mm -hmm. glad to see you again, Alan. Um, yes. And 
I'm going to I'm going to add a little bit to the beginning of this. You mentioned earlier that you teach a course at Conrad Grebel. If you would explain a little bit about how that relationship between AMBS and Conrad Grebel works or how it's benefiting students there. And then Laura has the question about whether there are any plans to offer something in person or online with CMU in Winnipeg. Oh, in Mennonite University for those of you for listening. Thank you, Laura, for that question. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Laura, and great to, I can't see you, but great to hear from you. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, um, uh, the um, the appointment that I have at, at, at Connor Grable, it's every other year, and it's, uh, and I teach the preaching course. This is the course that most of the Masters of Arts students at Connor Grable, um, the Masters of Arts in Theology, Oh, I think it's called it. It's a different degree. It's called something else, and I can't remember what it is. This is not good of me. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah. So I've been teaching that course every other year for several years. Um, one of the agreements, or one of the things we're working out with Connor Grable College, is that you can um, often do your degree, uh, your MA, uh, in at Connor Grable, and then complete an MDiv. Like a lot of those courses transfer. Um, to uh, to AMBS and you, we have a student graduating just this year who did some significant. Uh, I mean, she she graduated from the from the program at uh, Connor Grable and then came to AMBS and I think she was here for only two years, maybe three, and she was able to finish her MDiv and she's graduating this year. So that's one of the ways that we're that we're connecting. I wish there were a lot more connections. Um, I think there could be. Crossing the border is not always simple. Like that's actually an issue. Like to have AMBS professors teach in Canada and and uh, and vice versa to have Grable professors um, teaching at Goshen. It's it, or in Elkhart. It's not simple, right? To get visas and there's always border issues. I don't have border issues because I have a visa. I have a work visa in the U.S. But um, it's not straightforward and it's costly <clears throat> to do those kind of things. Now, we do have the option of of the internet and of more and more Zoom kinds of courses, so that kind of thing can work. Um, yeah, I'd love to teach some courses at uh, CMU and we do um, at times have uh, connections there as well. Um, yeah, I, you know, some years ago I taught a course in the summer school at CMU, which was great. It was like a one week long intensive thing. Um, and that was wonderful. Yeah, I would, uh, I, I mean, I would love for our schools to be working closer together as well. I, I know there's lots of reasons why we don't necessarily do that, but it would be as a teacher, I would, I would love that. Yeah. I'm just going to insert a little description from the admissions perspective, mm -hmm. what we do with Conrad Grable that's distinct. Um, normally, when someone has graduated, they, the Association of Theological Schools only would allow half of those credits to be applied to another kind of degree. And we got special permission from ATS because of our unique relationship with Canada. Um, we are a Canadian seminary, right? We're, we're part of that. So we got special permission to allow people to move right on from their MA into their MDiv and not lose any credits. And that's the unique thing about this relationship that has been so great, so. That's great. Great question. And we look for more questions to come in here. I'm gonna ask a few more that I have. Um, Alan, you mentioned that you love to cook. You're off, mm. I've heard you describe yourself, I think, I think, I heard, if I remember right, as a coffee snob. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so um, one of the things you're known for when you're on campus here is um, making specialty coffees and inviting people to come and enjoy those. And for a while you had a, a, a working relationship with somebody who made crepes and, and you no. made coffee. Can you tell us what that has been like for you to interact with the AMBS community as a coffee barista or whatever? <laughs> Want to call yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, when I retire, I want to be a, an actual barista. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, 
I mean, this, this uh, several years ago, we started this thing. Salome um, Haldeman was a student here from France, and she loves to make crepes, and I love to make cappuccinos. So we called it Crepes and Cappuccinos. And I think we ran this five or six times from the Dick Guest House and uh, on a Saturday morning. And I remember one time when I made 45 shots of espresso. I have a very nice espresso machine and uh, it's kind of industrial style. Um, and yeah, that was a very busy morning. That was the biggest one. Most of the other ones have been smaller, but um, yeah, we, we, I mean, this is not the only kind of social foodie event at AMBS. There's actually a lot of real, even during the pandemic, I mean, we, we took all the measures we could, but um, we were having picnics and potlucks and, and, and sharing food in various ways. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty, um, I mean, I love my falls at AMBS when I'm actually, uh, and I'm right there on campus, um, which is a lot of fun. And um, uh, uh, yeah, we work, uh, uh, we work, we work hard at having, well, that's probably not the right way to say it. We work at actually having fun together and it's, it's a really good time. And then sometimes I just have people over for coffee because it's good. <laughs> This is the legacy of my father. My father passed away uh, this last fall. And yeah, he, in his last, well, this is part, part of his whole life was that he was often at the coffee shop in whatever small town we lived at at nine o'clock in the morning. And also, no, at, at seven o'clock in the morning and then at 10 and then sometimes again at three. And it, it was about the coffee, but mostly it was about the conversations. Awesome. Um, I have another question. It's two parts. Um, how have you over the last 11 years seen the role of preaching evolving in the church? And the second part of that is, what do you think the pandemic has done to the role of preaching and, and how is it shifting? And will some of those changes be made more permanent or are we gonna shift back into the pre-pandemic ways of preaching? I'd just be interested to hear your- Wow, <clears throat> that's, that's good. Um, yeah, I just had a good conversation this morning with, with um, uh, I'll just say a, a woman preacher here in, in Ontario. And um, she talked about the reality that when she preaches, um, she mentions sometimes um, domestic violence and uh, talks about all kinds of things that are, that we used to not talk about from the pulpit. And I mean, so one of the big changes that's happened in preaching in the last 11 years is that we're getting we're getting more personal, personal. We're getting, I think preachers are more vulnerable uh, in a good way. I don't, I don't advocate for preachers to preach from their wounds, but from their scars. Is that, is that the right term? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you've got gone through something really recently, that's probably not the best thing to preach about. But if, 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 if it was a while ago and you've grown and learned and, and healed uh, in, a, in a big way from it, I mean, one of the biggest uh, sort of larger movements in preaching in the last 20 years, although it does include the last 11 as well, is kind of the, the, the uh, sort of storytelling to, to the preacher as testifier or, or witness to what's going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up in this whole, I grew up preaching in this whole era where we were telling stories, like in the 90s and the 2000s, it was all about stories. In fact, some preachers were, weren't even calling themselves preachers, they were, they were storytellers. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of a bit, but a story, storytelling can still be, I can be still pretty distant from the story I'm telling, right? Whether it's a story of Jesus or a story of, that's happened in our community. I can still be pretty distant from that. The, the move toward this other kind of preaching, sort of testimonial preaching, 
um, or, or preacher as witness, uh, that's a bit different because it includes me more, not that I'm going to be telling more stories about myself. That's not what this is about, but it's about being more human and being more vulnerable and opening up more conversations that are actually quite honest about life and faith. And I mean, this, of course, this connects now with swearing and with, <laughs> um, not that I'm advocating preaching and swearing together. I'm not doing that, but, but, but there's a kind of honesty that people are asking for these days about life and faith that simply wasn't true 50 years ago in this quite the same way. Uh, and so one of the things that we work at a lot in preaching is like, how honest can I be? <laughs> right. Um, and so, so this, this move from kind of storytelling preaching to, uh, the preacher as testifier or as witness to the faith or witness to the gospel. Uh, you can read more of that from Anna Carter Florence, um, in her book, preaching as testimony. Um, or you can also read that in uh, Thomas Long, um, Preacher as Witness. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. So that's one of the things that's shifted in preaching. I would say also one of the things that shifted in preaching in the last 11 years since I've been at AMBS, I would say in my first years there, and I was surprised by this, there were, an, uh, you know, most of the time, at least half half the students in the course are women and i think the first few courses i took most of the women in the class couldn't actually preach or it was it was not yeah they could sort of only preach because their husband preached most of the time or they or they were um the church was a bit skeptical of them preaching and so on um I remember one woman in one of the first class courses was just thrilled in the middle of the class that she was finally the first woman they had on the worship committee. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so I would say over the time I've been here, there have been more and more women who are recognized as preachers in their own right and who are lead pastors and expect to do that and who um, whose voices are respected. I'm still surprised that that's kind of new. <laughs> and in a way it isn't. There's lots of women who are preaching in MC Canada, MC USA and all over the world. But, but there are, it's just interesting that the seminary I've been seeing, uh, the opposite of that sometimes, right? And what was the second part of the question? <laughs> How has the pandemic changed preaching? Oh, yeah. And do you think that things will go back to the way they were before, or will those changes? Change? Yeah, that's good. Um, and while he's talking, please send your questions in. Yeah, this is a fascinating question. And uh, I mean, one of the things that, that I've heard from preachers is that they're preaching shorter sermons. And it's interesting that what that means is different for different people. So one space I was in on on a webinar uh, talking about this, uh, one of the persons said that they uh, their sermons were cut in half from 40 minutes to 20 minutes. <laughs> and then others were saying, uh, uh, yeah, no, for me, it's gone from 20 to 10 minutes, right? So so there's a kind of um, it's kind of brevity there that's that's interesting. And I don't know, I'm trying to think exactly why we're preaching shorter sermons. I think maybe we just have a different attention span on Zoom. Uh, and I think that's quite true. I think there's all kinds of things going on there. This is, I mean, really, if you think about it, I mean, I'm looking at myself right now. This is, in, in the whole history of human evolution, this is the first time that we're looking at, at ourselves and speaking, <laughs> right? And, and that we're, we're sitting in a room and, and I'm broadcasting all over and we're broadcasting all over North America. This is bizarre, right? Uh, in real time. And, 
uh, I think there's things that there are things that are happening to our bodies that th this whole thing of zoom fatigue is quite real. And part of it is, is the sound is different. I'm, I can, I can see you, but you're not three dimensions. Um, you, you sound slightly different on the computer. You look slightly different than in person. There's all kinds of things like that. And then seeing your whole church, you know, there on the screen, <laughs> it's odd. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, but but I mean, one of the advantages of preaching is that you can see my expressions, right? You can see, I can see the pre when I, when I attend Zoom services, I can see the face of the preacher a lot clearer than when I'm sitting in the pew. Now that can be different because sometimes the Zoom preacher is still uh, it's a long shot, right, where you see the whole pulpit perhaps and the whole body, and then. You don't see the face as well, but um, if I'm here, this this is how I've often preached online. It's like right here, so you can see my my expressions. You can't see my arms as much unless I do this, <laughs> but uh, you can see the full expression of the person, which I think has some real benefits. That's awesome. All right, um, there are. Uh about four people who have answered your question, Alan. Good, so yes. Note those and then see if you have any response to them. Audrey Miro said she did an MDiv with a pastoral counseling focus, but then did congregational ministry for 14 years, followed right. by intentional <clears throat> interim ministry for 20 years. Yeah. Uh, Mark Diller Harder has been a generalist, so he did the general MDiv, assumed he would pastor right after graduation, but worked for years with young adult ministry with Mennonite Church Eastern Canada before becoming a pastor. The end mm. give a good grounding. Um, what I don't remember is any guidance in becoming a tech expert or video editor for, <laughs> ah. uh, for being a pastor during the pandemic, which is awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Robin Walton noted that she got a Master of Arts in Christian Formation, was already a chaplain and continued in that role until retirement and began developing her skills as a spiritual director um, during her program at AMBS and has continued that beyond. Um, she has three directees now and uh, also mentions that in connection with her hospital work, she has developed a relationship with a local Somali mosque. Being steeped in Anabaptism did in fact prepare me to be open to other faiths. I learned at the mosque that uh, the leaders there, sorry, I have to scroll down here, all attended Mennonite schools in Somalia when they were growing up and credit the Mennonites for their place in the world now. And then uh, Laura Funk said she spent a glorious semester at AMBS and then slowly worked on her MA with CMU, Canadian, Canadian Mennonite University, did a focus on spiritual direction and has a private <clears throat> practice as a spiritual director for the past 10 years and now is doing that uh, work with um, Mennonite Church, Manitoba. And then she is heading into a congregation to work with seniors with a spiritual direction component. Um, oh, sorry, Audrey said that was Ken who, who did the focus on pastoral counseling. Sorry about that. Um, so Alan, any comments on those responses uh, to your question? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much for those. It's really interesting. I mean, it's, um, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, life takes us in all kinds of different directions. And um, yeah, it's good to hear all those, those mixtures of things that, that, uh, that people are doing. Yeah. yeah. So I have a follow up question to that. Um, yeah. One of the things that's changing at AMBS, I believe next year is that preaching yep. will now be required for mm -hmm. Doing an MDiv degree, and do you want to say a little bit about that? I think it reflects some of this yeah, uh, yeah. movement from what people think they're going to do to what they actually end up doing. What would you like to say about requiring a preaching class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just just so you know, I've been working at this, working at. I mean, it's not just me, but I've been working at having a preaching course for every MDiv student uh, for the last seven years, and here we are. Great, hallelujah. And also, I mean, also we've added um, as requirements to the to all MDiv programs, preaching and pastoral care. So that because these two things, um, 
You know, they're crucial in pastoral life. They're crucial in all kinds of, uh, of life of service in the church. I mean, one of the things that I was experiencing at AMBS is that students were um, doing MDivs or other kinds of, well, we'll just stick with MDivs, uh, Masters of Divinity. And, uh, and maybe they were thinking they were going to go do an academic route to do a PhD, or they were thinking they're going to be a chaplain, or there, there are all, all kinds of things that they were thinking they were going to do. And, and they end up preaching a lot, <laughs> right? So they'd come back to me and say, oh, yeah, I should have taken the preaching course. Um, and so we were, we were just trying to listen to that and, and hear that. And then I think the pastoral care thing was crucial too. Like, um, and this also came from a lot of um, conference ministers who were, who were noting that they had uh, persons with master of divinity who didn't have a preaching course or a pastoral care course. And they're like, wow. But again, um, uh, you know, uh, you can you can choose choose a, a course of study. And again, if you're thinking of going on to do a PhD, if you're thinking of going on to do church administration, you may not be thinking about some of these things. Reality is, though, in the Mennonite Church, if you're going to be well, in most denominations, if you're working in administration, if you're working at a parachurch organization, if you're working, you're still going to be preaching. And a crucial part of your work, even if you're, well, if you're an administrator is pastoral care, right? Like these are, these are really important things. So um, that's just a bit of background to, to that reality. Yeah. yeah and then we, we, we also, we, we also um, were hearing stories. This is just a few stories, but people saying, um, I'm going to do the, uh, I'm going to do take the sort of uh, MDiv theology route or peace studies route or biblical studies route so I don't have to take preaching because I don't want because I'm nervous about standing up in front of people and talking. I was like, OK, um, we could work at that. <laughs> and I want to work at that. Um, so so um, yeah, so I'm happy for this change. Back in 1986, when I started seminary, um, mm -hmm. two students were required to meet with Erland Waltner and June Alleman Yoder. And we did a little speech assessment. Yes. And then they talked about what are your plans? And I said, well, I'm, I'm planning to be a chaplain and I, I don't see myself preaching. Well, at that point, there weren't lots of women preaching, right? Yeah. And they both said to me, if you're going to get a seminary degree, you will be asked to preach. You really need to mm -hmm. be preaching. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And it really did transform my own uh, ministry and self-understanding. So I, I'm really excited about this change. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. seeing other questions coming in from our alums. I'm going to give you one more chance here. Uh, if you have a question you'd like to ask Alan, please type that in the Q&A feature right away. And Alan, um, as we think about all of the things we've covered today, are there things that you wish you would have had a chance to talk about yet? Uh, <clears throat> not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the things. Well, I, I think just a broad thing that the church um, yeah, that that the church will face and is facing is this whole issue of COVID itself, right? I mean, you talked about sort of the, the nature of, 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 you know, worship and preaching and so much. And so those kinds of things in the pan in, in the midst of a pandemic, I, I just think that this, yeah, there are ways in which, in which the, the world is being shaped by this pandemic. And I, I think that even removed from the issue that we're, meeting online and on zoom for worship that's going to have some big big um effects on the church in the future i'm not sure what those are but i think there's going to be we're going to look back on this era in some interesting ways i don't know what they're going to be but <laughs> but this is a this is a an interesting moment in the church that that i think um we're going to notice well, and another thing that's happening right now is the polarization of our society mm -hmm. yep. affecting the church as well in, in some contexts more than others. Yep. How, 
how do you work at preaching in a polarized setting? Like what, what are your students asking about and what are you, um, what are you introducing as you think about that? Yeah, there's some, um, there's, uh, there's more and more kind of literature out there. One of my uh, friends in, and I can't remember her name, um, in the Academy of Homiletics, which is the sort of guild that I'm connected with, with preaching, um, wrote a book actually a few years ago called, um, you know, Preaching in the Purple Church, right? Because the blue and the red. So it's a very, it's an American kind of perspective. But um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and and these these things are cut differently in different places. So the kind of polarization in Canada is different than in the U.S. And of course, in different parts of the U.S., it's different. Um, different kinds of issues happening in places like Ethiopia and Venezuela. And I, I mean, so so there's there's uh, I mean, one of the things we often say at AMBS is we'll just stick to the Bible. <laughs> and there's actually, I mean, I know that the Bible can still be used. There it is. Preaching in the Purple Zone. Yes. Um, yeah, I would recommend that book highly. Um, uh, but yeah, we talk about, we talk, I mean, the Bible can be, we, I can preach this super conservative sermon from the Bible. And I can preach a super liberal sermon if, if those are the, the, the sort of the polarities. Um, but there is something about sticking with the text and letting the text speak. That's uh, sort of easier said than done, but um, yeah. You know, one of the things that um, uh, this is massive study done on preaching in, yeah, it's more like the 2010 kind of era. They interviewed 260 some people who love listening to sermons, these lay people, and they, they eventually produced four books it's called listening to the listeners. Um, if you want to look it up, um, one of the things they found they weren't looking for this. They found that about a third of the people listen to sermons, not because of its style or its form, like is it exegetical or narrative or what? They listen to the sermon because they love the preacher, right? Uh, or they have deep respect for the preacher, right? So there's there's something about the ethos of the, I mean this course has to do with the congregational structure as well but um you know that you're, you're listening to the preacher uh, and you're listening to the sermon not because of their political views or this or this or this but because they were there when your dad died and they really helped your family through it and you just see throughout the the pastor's life that they're um preaching the gospel with their life and that helps us to listen right to the preacher <laughs> Um, so I would, I would go back to that, um, more than style or sometimes even things that are said, um, that, <clears throat> that our lives are a witness to the gospel. Thank you so much, Alan, for sharing with us today, for all of the questions you've answered. And we're so glad to get a better glimpse into the work you do. I want to thank all the alumni who've joined us today as well, and thank you for your ongoing support of AMBS. If you haven't given yet uh, this year, this uh, fiscal year, I invite you to do that. Your financial support is so helpful to us, and also your um, encouragement of other people that you know to support us. Um, and if you know of people that you'd like to have take a course, please put them in touch with us or send us their name and contact information. We keep finding that our alumni and pastors are the primary um, motivating force for many people to start seminary studies. Uh, having someone tap them on the shoulder really does make a difference. Um, if you have a course you'd like to take, we have several courses being offered this summer in our summer term and what really exciting courses. Um, you can sign up for those online as well. Please stay connected through our Church Leadership Center. You might have seen that we have a webinar coming up on May 4th with Drew Strait on Christian nationalism. And there are already over 300 people registered for that webinar. We are so excited about the response to that. Um, if you haven't yet signed up and are interested, uh, do that right away. 
Uh, next month on May 19th, our third Thursday conversation has changed from what was earlier um, announced. Um, Rachel Miller Jacobs is getting the chance to go to Tanzania for the first ordinations of women in the Tanzanian Mennonite church. So AMBS librarian Carl Stutzman will be joining us um, to talk about his work as library director. Also, thanks to Janet McGeary, our student uh, AV tech, who provided all of our technical support today. This concludes this month's third Thursday program. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us.